Okay, so for today's lesson, we're going to look at um, a different, a couple different ways of uh, calculating the amount of content of food and how um, you know different measurements um, you can use to calculate your intake of lipids as well as carbs and proteins. So the first thing you have to do for this lesson, um, very easily, just go on to these two websites. At the same. Um, and you should be able to determine uh, your estimated calorie needs um, per day. And it should give you an idea of how much of each type of food group uh, that you require. And then you can compare and see how much you actually eat. Now, there are a lot of really good um, apps out there that you can use as well um, to do all this kind of stuff. So um, this is already something that's quite mainstream and um, should be used. Um, BMI which is the body mass index um, something that a lot of people especially if you're in um, if you're super into sports and fitness you should have seen this and you should know um, how to calculate this but essentially it's just the it's a ratio of a person's weight in kilograms divided by the square of their height in meters so it was it was developed um, to provide some sort of a uh, measurement um, to see whether or not uh, people are either overweight or underweight or whether they're um, absolutely normal based on the height, uh, based on their own height. And so it's, it's meant to be sort of a relative measurement um, to try and figure out and compare different uh, sec uh, sectors of the population. Now the idea with this is, uh, and you can do this for, your, for yourself as well, the one that we would use is this bottom uh, equation where we had the weight in kilograms divided by the height squared. Um, if you were in America or in Britain, you would use um, the one with pounds um, and you can do it in inches um, squared. So in terms of the body, so if you're doing a straight up calculation, it's quite easy and you can just plug things in. Um, if you, you can also do this, and this is something that you will see on the exam is using something called a nomogram. And so a nomogram is meant to be a more um, a, a analog way of uh, looking at this and being able to calculate uh, your BMI. And so the, the, what you would do um, is locate on both um, sides um, of, the, of the chart here, your weight and your height. So for example, a person, um, let's say a male uh, who is 70 kilograms um and is a height let's say 175 right so you would plot those two points um and then you take a ruler and you do a straight edge um line between the two points um, and remember you will these type of questions will come up on your paper two for which um and you should have your ruler uh, with you anyways for any exam uh just draw the line out like this and wherever this point um, intersects on this mid one, so over here, um, for a male, it's a little, the ratio is a little bit higher. Uh, but in this case, it intersects right at this point right there. And so for this person who is uh, 70 kilograms and 175 centimeters, uh, has a BMI of approximately 23, which is just, it's for men, it's inside um, the acceptable range. For females, it's just on the upper edge of the acceptable range. So you could do your own. Um, you can take a look at, uh, and you can even compare and see where you should be in terms of acceptability, um, whether or not if you are under or overweight. Um, and in the relatively, um, if you are below 20, um, it's generally tend to be, that's the underweight um, uh, point. So uh, that's a, it's a general rule and anything above 30 is the obese uh, range. So between 20 and about 25 is acceptable, 25 to 30 is, is overweight, and then 30 and above is obese, 20 and below is underweight. So just going back to the previous slide, in terms of the body mass um, index, if for instance, someone's uh, BMI is too high, um, it can indicate, there are a couple of issues we're gonna look at with this, um, but it can indicate that this person has some sort of uh, health problems and some of the more common health problems that could be associated um, 
include uh, things like type 2 diabetes, uh, gallstones, hypertension, so high blood pressure. Uh, you can have arthritis, uh, especially later on in life. Um, the chance of stroke increases and the chance of uh, heart disease will also increase. Whereas um, for someone who has a low BMI, um, it could be a measure, uh, a, sorry, an indicator of that person being malnourished. And so they're not getting enough calories, they're not getting enough of the right types of nutrients in their calories. Um, and so this is also something that's concerning. And some of the some of the diseases and some of the uh, uh, mental disorders um, that can be associated with this include uh, hyperthyroidism, uh, again, diabetes uh, can lead to some forms of cancer. Uh, we have anorexia and bulimia. Okay, I spelled that wrong there. There we go. Um, so these are just some, some, uh, disease and mental disorders that could be associated with that. Now, there are a couple problems with, um, BMI. And, uh, there, you know, if people are, uh, especially for those of you who are into sports and you understand um, how this is calculated um, and how you know um, when you're putting on weight in terms of uh, in terms of muscle mass um, this can be a really big issue um, in terms of giving you a proper sense of um, your body um, so if you were um, say on the PowerPoint slide for BMI if you look at um, slide 16 and 17 you see in one picture you see the rock and the second picture you see Blake Griffin who's a basketball player um, so Blake Griffin is um, six foot ten which in inches I could calculate this um, is about uh, which is about 82 inches um, so about let's say 208 or so so that's Blake Griffin right there And his weight is 251 pounds, which is about 113, 114 kilos, right? So if we take a look at his, um, if we draw his um, line out here, it's going to show right, that's the closest you can sort of get. And he actually falls in the range. If we find the point, it's he's in the overweight range um, at about 26 or so. And so he's falling into a range, even though he's, um, you know, as an athlete, he works out, he probably stays away from his diet, is heavily controlled by his team. Um, it doesn't make any sense, right? So he, we know that for athletes and, and weightlifters, this is, this is, it's an issue and it doesn't actually apply to them, uh, because most of the weight that they have, they're carrying is all protein and, and muscle mass. And so, um, so this has to be taken with a grain of salt. But for, for the general population, it is a good indicator, um, and it is an indicator, and that's it. Um, of whether or not uh, you, you what where your body is at is healthy or not. So athletes um, carry more muscle mass. And thus we'll have a higher BMI. But this doesn't indicate Uh, indicate any health problems. Now, if you're, uh, if you guys watch WWE, uh, there's this guy who was called Big Show, who was about seven feet tall and about 500 pounds. Um, 
he may be loosely an athlete, but he's also got really big issues in terms of his health. Um, so it, it really depends on the sport that you're looking at. And most um, uh, sort of endurance-based sports, um, the athletes tend to be a lot more healthier, uh, regardless of what the BMI is telling you. So the next thing we're going to do is look at um, on page 13, and you can combine this with um, a PowerPoint that I've uh, put in here called um, Health Risks of Fat. So this is a PowerPoint that goes with it. It has a bunch of graphs showing you the difference in terms of uh, the four different types of fats that we look at in our nutrition, so trans fats, saturated fats, mono and polyunsaturated fats. Um, and the focus of this using these links right here, I know there's a WebMD link here, but um, it is quite decent in terms of talking about the, the science of trans fats, um, is to look at and answer these questions about trans and saturated fats and how and how and why they are um, they are not good for people, especially trans fats, which have now been banned in many countries um, because of their severe risk um, towards cardiac disease and, and cancer that they cause. Um, this page, I think this is more um, just for your own, uh, just FYI. Um, it's meant to be uh, for you to be able to evaluate um, certain types of health claims that are made. Um, especially nowadays when we have, we are inundated by um, advertisements and, and commercials uh, about different types of health uh, fads and claims. Um, and it's just, in, just, just to keep your mind open in terms of um, not everything that is shown uh, about a certain type of diet or a certain type of this and that um, has any um, legitimate claim to it. Um, and a lot of times the best way to actually figure this out is actually looking at um, the science behind it. And so if we're looking at something like trans fats, uh, this isn't just something that we, uh, there isn't, there is scientific proof behind um, trans fats and the fact that they, the health effects that they have and the reason why they've now been banned in many countries. And so if you look at this, um, this paper right here, and if you use the, um, so this uh, page right here, it is the same name uh, for the PowerPoint. Um, so you can take a look at it. And again, it's got um, diff a bunch of different questions and graphs that you can look at in terms of the cardiovascular disease and the types of um, diseases that you can get um, and how they increased uh, over the years. Um, but in terms of just this paper right here, if we're looking at a scientific paper, there's a few things that you want to look at um, when you're when you're trying to evaluate whether or not this is a legitimate uh, claim that's being made. So in the case of this, this is a claim that trans fats have severe effects, um, and and this will be something that comes in handy when you're when you're looking at writing your IAs. Um, but also if you're if you're looking at uh, doing uh, any type of extended essay as well, you're going to be looking at primary sources, and and you want to be taking a look at the legitimacy of those primary sources. So first of all, in this paper you've got a team of researchers who are clearly um, researchers working in, in quite a few distinguished um, universities around the world, um, so from different places. You've got uh, universities here that are listed, um, including one of which is Harvard Medical School. Um, that have public funding. For the research. Uh, you just within the abstract here, um, you you can see uh, parts of this where um, they, they, they tell you the method that they used. And so part of this, they had both, um, they had controlled experiments, so they know exactly which variables they were testing for. And they also say that this was a long-term observational study, um, just loosely without going into the actual paper itself, telling you or giving you an idea that there's a lot of data that's available here.
And then finally, you've got um, in the bottom half of this paragraph right here, you've got uh, lots of factual and objective language. Um, they're not uh, trying to uh, get you to make your mind up about anything. They're just giving you the facts straight up and then you can decide, not even decide, you you know that these are um, these are based on data. These are not just claims that are being made out of nowhere. And so these are conclusions and, and results that have been, uh, that have directly been um, uh, observed and they've been, um, that they've gone through trials of this. And then at the end of it, um, there is a, a reference link to it and it's a reference link um, to uh, the peer reviewed journal that this is published in uh, with the citation. So something like this where, you know, when you, especially when you get into university, but I, I would highly recommend you look for your IAs when you do your IAs, um, you're getting your data from uh, primary sources like this um, because you have a substantial amount of evidence that you can go back on that is that is tested and it's, and it's reliable rather than just looking on random websites here and there um, without any citations, just making claims um, and being able to distinguish between the two of them. And finally, the last thing um, is just, it's just a uh, sort of a review um, of what we looked at on this last page right here. Um, just looking at how, and I talked about this when we, when we did um, lipids and carbohydrates, the difference for long-term energy storage. And so there is a uh, PDF document uh, that you can use to take a look at. I believe it starts with 2.0. And the idea here being that uh, the difference between, uh, and you can divide up your page however you want here. Right. So in terms of looking at the two of them, we've got lipids, which um, we talked about are a slow energy. Uh, they are able to uh, store chemical energy. Uh, for long periods of time. And relatively to carbohydrates, they actually have approximately two times uh, the amount of energy per gram compared to carbs. Whereas in carbs, um, this, is a, this is a reliable, fast release of energy. Uh, where this uh, this form of energy or these nutrients are quickly digested, um, so they'll be digested, uh, absorbed, and used. And again, when you're comparing the two of them, they have about half the energy per gram compared to lipids. The general idea being that uh, carbs are easy to build into polysaccharides to digest. Whereas for lipids, um, it is, the, again, lipids don't form into the polysaccharides. They just, they store themselves as is, uh, but they take, uh, it takes longer uh, to store and thus it's going to take longer uh, to break down So that's the end of unit 11 right there. Um, we will get started on unit 12 
um, on Thursday. Your deadline to submit Unit 11 booklets is next Wednesday, the 27th of January. Um, and just make sure you're getting all your uh, previous unit booklets um, submitted as soon as possible.